recording was made in April 1977, when Paul Foote, then a journalist on Socialist Worker, spoke at the Socialist Workers' Party rally in Skegness. His subject was Tom Paine. The previous year, 1976, had been the bicentenary of the American Revolution, and the establishment in both Britain and the United States had made a show of celebrating it widely. But they left out Tom Paine, because he represented a part of that great revolution that they would rather forget. Paul Foote set out to redress the balance. The uh, British Parliament is affili affiliated to the Interparliamentary Union, and the Interparliamentary Union laid on a very fine operation for British members of Parliament to go over to America to celebrate the American, uh, the victory of the American colonies over the British government in, uh, in the war which ended, as a matter of fact, not in 1776, but in 1783. And uh, there were 24 members of Parliament, that's pretty good for an inter-parliamentary union binge. 24 of them, I think they were selected, are called pro rata, according to party, 10 Labour, 10 Tories, and I think 4 Liberals, something of that nature, maybe a Scottish Nationalist or a Welsh Nationalist got in on the operation. And they went over on the Concord with an enormous bell, which had been uh, built somewhere or other, uh, with the word liberty written on it. And the Tory MP for Norfolk North, who was on the delegation, as he proudly proclaimed, because he is the Tory MP for Thetford, which is where Thomas Paine was born, came back to this country after the booze and the binge and uh, made this very interesting declaration explaining what it was that happened uh, in America when the 24 MPs went over there. We rang the bell a number of times and then we had a jolly good time. <laughs> that was uh, what happened there. A number of other things happened. A number of other things happened. The speech of Edmund Burke, which was uh, the famous speech and pamphlet that he wrote in favour of the American colonies and the case for separation from, uh, from Britain, was read aloud in the Carlton Club, uh, which is a club uh, in, to which you have to be a member of the Tory party and a, a male member of the Tory party, I understand, which is causing some difficulty at the moment uh, in relation to the leader of the Tory party, uh, was read aloud there to a number of Tories shouting, hear, 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 hear. <laughs> and a number of other things were done of uh, similar uh, importance to show that really this was a very important episode and that there were some very important people in the American Revolution. There was General Washington and there was General Wayne and there was General Butler and there was a man called John Adams and a man called Samuel Adams and a man called... Thomas Jefferson, and they were all great men, and they carried through the American Revolution, and those were the people that were sung and danced about during the whole of last year at enormous expense to a whole number of rich people. That's what happened throughout the whole of the year. All kinds of magnificent exhibitions, exhibitions of officers' uniforms were specially put on in Bath in order that people could go and look and see how wonderful the officers' uniforms were that were worn by uh, American officers and indeed by British officers uh, during the war, uh, the war for independence. All these things happened. And from time to time, uh, as with the incident of the Tory MP for Norfolk North, people mentioned a man called Thomas Paine. There was a book written by Thomas Paine called Rebel, a biography of Thomas Paine, which if you ever see it, I strongly advise you not to buy it. And I'm very, uh, I'm very glad to see that it's been remaindered at 50p, and it certainly isn't worth that. <laughs> this is the way in which the gentleman who wrote this, who is a particularly revolting hack, who operates, <coughs> who operates around the sort of snuff, snuffles around the Congress and the various people there, and thought it would be a good idea to write a book about Thomas Paine, uh, uh, said this. Uh, the truth of the matter is that Paine was not the major American figure that he imagined himself to be. He had made valuable contributions to the cause of liberty during the revolution, but his importance had dwindled uh, year by year for a decade and a half. He had not been forgotten, 
but his deeds belong to the past, not the present. And this was something his inflated ego would not allow him to admit. This is really the position of pain taken by this uh, gentleman, and really this whole work is a thing to show that Payne was all right so long as he supported General Washington and General Wayne and General Butler and Thomas Jefferson and Samuel Adams and John Adams and all the other famous people of the American, uh, of the American Revolution. But in so far as he did not support them, and even this book indicates that he did not support them all the time, then of course that was due to his inflated ego and the fact that he really wasn't worth being talked about at all. Now let us see if we can find out a little bit of the truth about what Thomas Paine, who Thomas Paine was, and what the American Revolution was about. He was born in Thetford in Norfolk, and he was the son of a staymaker, apprenticed as a staymaker, very important trade at that time. And uh, he, uh, he lived for the first period of his life as practically no record whatever. Nothing said about him, very little written about him, just a few things occasionally which he wrote himself which have come down to us. He was an excise man, he was a sailor, he worked almost entirely with working people of one kind or another. When he was an excise man, he wrote a, a, a pamphlet arguing that the excise men, customs officials, should not be seen as people that were always bribing and corrupting working people, which they were expected to do most of their time, but should, be, should, should, should be, get a decent salary and have a trade union and things of that kind. That's about the only document that comes down from the whole of the early part of his life. And in case there are any youth worshippers, and I've noticed that there are a few uh, youth worshippers around in the organization nowadays, in case there are any youth worshippers uh, around us here, it should be pointed out, and people should remember, that Payne was 38 years old when he sailed for America in 1774. Uh, before he'd written anything at all, really, of any consequence whatever, before he'd made any impact of any kind whatever, he was uh, 38 years old. Indeed, before he wrote a pamphlet which went to more than three or four people, he was 40, 41, something of that kind. I'm sure that uh, there's a lesson in that for all of us. Now, in, uh, in when... What he went to America to do, as a matter of fact, and this isn't so well known perhaps, was to set up a school for women, because he had been, during the whole period of his life, very interested in the woman question. So what it was called today, the woman question. He had uh, noticed the way in which women were treated at that time, particularly in the aristocracy of, uh, of Britain, and he went there specifically, and he had a letter from Benjamin Franklin to the effect, to set up a school there in which uh, young women could be educated, which was then a very uh, revolutionary idea. Here is something that when he got to America, of course the place was in some ferment at that time, 1774, and when he got there, he gravitated fairly quickly onto a thing called the Pennsylvania Magazine in Philadelphia, Philadelphia being the largest city in America at that time. And the Pennsylvania Magazine being a magazine which was circulating not just among uh, wealthy merchants and radical merchants and people of that kind, but also among many of the working people of Philadelphia that were growing at that time in confidence and in strength. And here is something just uh, because I just read it because I think it's remarkable that it was written at this time, 20 years before Mary Wollstonecraft wrote The Rights of Woman, and incidentally, Mary Wollstonecraft was a very great friend and, uh, and comrade of Paine's uh, during, the later, during later years. Uh, this, is, this is what he wrote uh, immediately when he came onto the Pennsylvania magazine and started to write a column there. He wrote at once about women and he wrote a whole number of articles on the question. Affronted in one country by polygamy, which gives them their rivals for inseparable, inseparable companions, enslaved in another by indissoluble ties, which often join the gentle to the rude and sensibility to brutality. Even in countries where they may be esteemed most happy, constrained in their desires, in the disposal of their goods, robbed of freedom of will by the laws, the slaves of opinion, which rules them with absolute sway and construes the slightest appearances into guilt, surrounded on all sides by judges who are at once their tyrants and seducers, and who after having prepared their faults, punish every lapse with dishonor. 
man with regard to women in all climates and in all ages has been either an insensible husband or an oppressor but they have sometimes experienced the cold and deliberate oppression of pride and sometimes the violent and terrible tyranny of jealousy when they are not beloved they are nothing and when they are they are tormented they have almost equal cause to be afraid of indifference and of love over three quarters of the globe nature has placed them between contempt and misery twenty years before Mary Wollstonecraft that was pretty good and I don't think that you'll find very much like that written really in the whole of our, hit, uh, of, of our literature about women before that period 1774 the other thing which affected him very much during the period in which the early period in which he was in Pennsylvania was that he went down to uh, see the slaves the slave market in Philadelphia and he saw there and describes it himself the sale of the slaves the sale of a woman slave and child the, the woman and child being sold as it were with one lot and all the merchants gathered round and fingering the merchandise and being the merchandise being advocated by the uh, the people that were carrying out the auction the slave auctioneers at that time and Paine describes this incident and describes how the result of it was that he was for three days and nights physically sick and the whole of his time there in America after seeing that incident was devoted a whole whenever he came to the subject was devoted to this question of slavery and getting rid of the question and getting rid of slavery it is interesting I take it on a few years now just on that subject that when the Declaration of Independence was written in 1776 by Thomas Jefferson or the, he masterminded the writing of it there was a section written by Paine himself on the question of slavery calling for the abolition of slavery throughout the whole of the United States which were then about 13 at that time the whole of America call, it weren't called the United States of course throughout the whole of America at that time calling for the abolition of slavery Paine wrote the section dealing with slavery in the strongest possible terms arguing bitterly with Jefferson what was the point of having a declaration of independence what was the point of coming and saying that we Americans are now free from the servitude of Britain if we same Americans are going to conduct this miserable slave trade that was going on at that time what was the point of that he argued with Jefferson and Jefferson said you write the section on slavery and they included the section on slavery in the draft program of the Declaration of Independence and it was held out only by the pressure of the great slaveholders of Georgia and Carolina those two states in particular held out the section but there it is there still today the section there on slavery written by Paine and so we have this astonishing situation that when the Declaration of Independence was written it was written without a single reference to the fact that whole numbers of people in that free America who were declaring themselves free from the uh, rule of Britain the savagery of the of British rule the whole number of them the Declaration of Independence whole number of them were still uh, slaveholders slave owners and they allowed the slave situation to exist in, in America perhaps for another hundred years following that at any rate on women and on the question of slavery these are the subjects about which Paine wrote when he was uh, in those early years uh, on the Pennsylvania magazine but of course all these subjects combined in the one great subject and the one great agitation which was started up at that period just about the period that Paine got there the idea that the Americas should be separate from Britain the idea that the British colonial rule stamped there by a corrupt court as corrupt a court as ever ever been known and that's saying something in the history of the British monarchy uh, was stamping there with new taxations all different kinds of uh, pressures on the Americas the, this agitation for separation the agitation that, that America should be free uh, should be free from Britain now of course that agitation was started or at any rate promoted in a whole number of places by the more radical of the merchants it's not true of course it's a myth a 1976 myth that this agitation had well, went right through the whole of Americas and all decent Americans were on the side of it of course there were numberless Tories particularly in Philadelphia where 10% of the population owned 80% of the wealth as probably they do today the position were in, in, particularly in Philadelphia there were a number of Tories that said we want the crown we want the British crown we ally ourselves to the British crown and we're against any agitation of any kind 
But the agitation started or was promoted in the early in the early parts in the early years of the of the seventeen seventies was promoted to some extent by the rich merchants, by the people that allied themselves with what we would now call the ruling class, with property, with a nascent property growing merchandise, merchants that were operating at that time. And uh, the um, a chief among these was this man, uh, John Adams. I think uh, a very interesting little story about what was going on in America at that time is best told by Adams himself, rich man, a man who later became an extremely reactionary uh, senior official of the, uh, of the independent America. And when Adams was originally dabbling in this uh, uh, radical idea of separation and promoting this idea of separation, uh, his wife wrote to him, it was a fairly cheeky thing for a wife to do anyway, to write to her husband at that time in history, but at any rate, uh, his wife uh, Abigail wrote to him, begging him, please John, when writing your new uh, constitution, to remember the ladies. That was the way in which he put it, to remember the ladies. And he wrote back a really quite furious letter saying that this was not the time to remember the ladies, if indeed there ever was a time to remember them. And this is why he explained, he said, we can't allow the agitation over separation to go off into other matters. We can't allow other matters to come into this at all. It's a simple question of separation from the crown and me then being in charge after the crown have left. And this is what he wrote, this is the paragraph that he wrote to her, which I think sums up really what was going on in America at that time. We have been told that our struggle has loosened the bonds of government everywhere, that children and apprentices are disobedient, that schools and colleges are grown turbulent, that Indians slight their guardians, and Negroes grow insolent with their masters. We've been told that, he said, and it's our job to keep that down. And it's our job to ensure that any agitation that we set up here to free America from Britain does not allow the Negroes and the children and all these other people who are promoted to disobedience by what we're doing does not allow that disobedience to get out of hand. In other words, we have to tread this very tight rope that we have to whip people up and agitate them on the question of separating America from Britain and get them to join armies if necessary in order to defeat the British army but we've got at all the time to ensure that the rule of property and the rule of people who are born to rule such as Adams and the like uh, is, is maintained. That really uh, does give us a clue as to what was happening and as soon as the uh, uh, what, what was happening in, in, in America at that time that as soon as the uh, British army invaded, as the agitation took, uh, grew, grew in, sp in strength, as soon as the British army invaded and came into America, then those two revolutions, if you like, that two battles that were going on really came to the fore. On the one hand, the fight for separation. On the one hand, the battle, the simple battle between armies on the question of whether, whether Britain goes on ruling America or whether America rules herself. And on the other hand, a quite different battle that was going on all the way through the country and particularly in the big cities like Philadelphia. A battle between the growing free labor whole numbers of freed indentured apprentices, large numbers of slaves that were being freed for, as a result of the agitation and freed really as a result of the necessity for militia to be set up, the necessity for armies to be set up to beat the British, whole numbers of working people of different descriptions coming into the, into the political arena and seeing the battle against Britain as a battle for something different than just another round of slavery once, uh, once the British had been chucked out. There was that agitation that went really on all through that period, all through the period from 1776 to 1783. A great movement of the common people, a huge movement which saw beyond the narrow fields which uh, John Adams and the like had held out in front of people. And it was Thomas Paine that came and gave that idea of a new world after America had won secession from the British Thomas Paine that gave that idea its most electric effect and lit up that idea throughout the whole of the common people in America. He wrote a book in the early part of 1776, soon after the British army had uh, entered the country and uh, the same year as the Declaration of Independence. He wrote a book called Common Sense, very good title. 
And it was a book that was written, as all his books were written, in this language which was directed centrally to the masses. Everything that he wrote was directed to the masses. And ere he raised for the first time in that book, Common Sense, the idea of a republic, not as something which was insulting. The word republic had always been used in the past as something that was an insult. People were called republicans in the same way perhaps today as we are called communists, red filth and so on and so forth. People were called republicans like that. Paine turns it on his head. He establishes the idea of the republic, the idea of the people being in charge of their destiny and being in charge of their government as central to the whole idea of the fight against the, uh, uh, against the, um, against the British. I, I, I heard the, the comrade from South Africa speaking here this morning and the, 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 the way the thing rings out the when, when he spoke at the end about the need for uh, emancipation, not just emancipation from apartheid and emancipation from white rule but emancipation from exploitation as being part of the operation there that thing he seemed to ring back 200 years to all those things that I've been reading uh, about Tom Paine over this period here's just a little bit of it uh, just to show uh, first of all of course there is and there is this in all his writing too this violent really savage attack upon all people who set themselves up in positions of power and influence with nothing but heredity to sustain them and nothing but wealth to sustain them. Men who look upon themselves as born to reign and on the others to obey soon grow insolent. Selected from the rest of mankind, their minds are easily poisoned by importance and the world they act in differs so materially from the world at large that they have but little opportunity of knowing its true interests. He spoke about a new world people being in charge of their own lives afterwards, that there was no Adams or no Washington that was going to stand in their way. And although in many of his writings he built up Washington as a great military leader, he all the time, all the way through that, identified with this idea of a new world coming, which, uh, which, which had to be established. Now, common sense, it's an astonishing thing, but common sense sold in four weeks 250,000 copies. Now you have to think of this, that uh, that meant effectively, it really meant this, no less than this, that every literate family in America had a copy of it. Every literate, either a copy of it or access to a copy of it, and this is more important, and this goes through the whole of the rest of his writings, not just the literate families that had access to it, but the illiterate people access to it too. That everywhere where common sense was read about in taverns, in a whole number of places where people met together, in the, street, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the militia, the corporal's guards read out the common sense. The thing was read out there and it had the effect, literally, of first of all destroying one by one the arguments for the British crown, the arguments for the reasons why Britain should be in charge of America, taking the Tory arguments and taking them one by one and striking them off. Secondly, destroying people's faiths in monarchs in, in people are being in power just because they are the sons of their fathers and the like. And thirdly, holding out this prospect of the Republic. These are the things that common sense did and it went right through the working people of America, the lower classes of America, the people who formed the militia, the people who were described in the militia by people like Adams as the riff-raff of our country, the, the riff-raff, that is, the riff-raff, the foreign scum, all those Jewish people and Irish people and black slaves that had joined up the, the, the militia were really fired by this idea of co the, this, uh, the, the ideas that were, in the, that were in common sense. And Paine was not a man to hang around on the outside writing, uh, uh, writing uh, tracts. It's worth mentioning also, by the way, and this again is true of all, everything that he wrote, and immediately he wrote something for a cause, he transferred the whole of the royalties from what he'd written to that cause. That everything, the common sense was selling in its first print at two shillings each. He sold the first 150,000 at two shillings. That would have made him one of the richest men in America if he'd taken the the, the rewards from it. Every penny, every single penny, the enormous bulk of Paine's life is spent in fairly abject poverty, the enormous bulk of it. Even though for some section of his life he was Secretary of Foreign Affairs to the American Congress, the whole, all the whole of his life was spent in abject poverty at a time when he could have been a millionaire by the writings that he uh, distributed to the working people. Everything went to the Continental Congress. 
everything went to the battle in Pennsylvania to get some kind of radical representation on the Continental Congress. That's what happened to the money that he made from it. But it wasn't just a question of writing, and it wasn't just a question of royalties going elsewhere. It was also, he was also a man who saw that what he wrote depended on how he acted and with whom he acted. And when the uh, British army came in, and uh, it was, an, of course, an extremely powerful army, all the mythology about uh, the, 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 uh, the American War of Independence, most of it is a lot of dribble. For most of the time, the American army was on the run, really on the run. The militia, which had nothing like the power and force of the, uh, of the uh, invading army, something not uncommon to what we call today guerrilla warfare was fought there by the American army constantly moving out of places, moving in retreat, holding this great army, this huge great mercenary army, most of which had been, uh, or great bulk of which had been uh, recruited in Germany, Hessian troops, uh, uh, moved in such a way that they were able to push the American army all the time in front of them. And most of the time they were on the run, and they suffered a whole series of terrible defeats. In, uh, in 1776 itself, Washington's army was uh, smashed in, uh, in New York, driven out of New York, driven down the Delaware River, all the way to Trenton, driven there, and as it was driven, so desertions, whole numbers of people deserting, whole numbers of battalions deserting it, 5,000 men, 10,000 men come down to 7,000 men, come down to 5,000 men, and as the desertions happen, so the bloody Tories in the Philadelphia and in the Pennsylvania Congresses, Georgia and Carolina, start shrieking for the disbandment of the army, for the accepting of the British terms. All that happened in 1776. Payne bought a gun, never used one in his life before, but he bought a musket. I think that was about the only money, with his last uh, few pennies, he bought a gun. And he went and joined the army on that road out of New York all the way down to Trenton. He marched with the men, day in, day out, month in, month out. He fought with them, got trapped with them in, uh, in rear guard actions. All that operation never took a horse, all the officers had horses, he never had a horse, he was always there with the men, arguing with them, discussing the question of common sense, known and respected by them, but part of them. And he went all the way down there, down the Delaware River to Trenton, and that was where they looked to be finished. It could have been really finished then. The Hessian army followed them across the river, and the two armies faced them across the river. The great, big, powerful German mercenary army there, with all the training, all the weaponry, and on the other side, the raggle-taggle, broken muskets, uh, uh, wet weapons, very few provisions, deserted army uh, 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 of the Americas. And uh, coming there... That just four or five days before Christmas, 1776, Payne came into the camp and wrote on the, on the drumhead, writing on a drumhead, writing with a pencil on a drumhead, he wrote out this first of the 13 papers which he called the American Crisis, the Crisis Paper. These are the times that try men's souls, the, the, the paper that starts with that. that, 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 uh, that, that that's, uh, in that Crisis Paper, he held out again the prospect of the new world. Again, he appealed to people. Now is the time we have to come together and fight, and we have to fight not just for generals, not just for officers, but we have to fight for an age of the common man and a, and a, and a new government of the common man. Everything there in cri the crisis paper was written. It was taken in the handwriting back to Philadelphia. They haggled, you know, Washington sent the order. We want this published. We want this published now, and they had to haggle with the printers to get it published even. So strong was the Tory opposition in Philadelphia at that time. And they brought it back, 10,000 copies, and distributed to the troops. And those troops that couldn't read, every corporal's guard brought them together and read out the crisis paper. And that, that, that was on the Christmas Eve, 1776. And that evening, in the most fantastic military effort, they brought every small boat down, down the Delaware, crossed the Delaware and on Christmas night went into the German camp where they were just drinking to the victory the following morning that they were going to have over the Americas, ransacked the camp, took a thousand prisoners and the, uh, the American Revolution was sustained. It may, if it had held two or three more days, the thing would have changed. But the point is that the agitation, but most importantly, the agitation coming out of the common man, out of the idea of the common people being in charge of their situation, being able to go and do what seemed to be an absolutely impossible task, was central to that agitation. And all the way through that period, these two battles continued. The battle on the one hand of the American army against the British army, 
sustained to some extent by those radical merchants and the like. And on the other hand, the battle in the cities and the battle in the army, fundamentally important, the battle in the army itself against the idea of officer power, against the idea of hereditary succession and hereditary rule, and people being in charge and be able to make orders and dictate to other people because they're the sons of their fathers and the like. That was, uh, uh, th that was what going on, and that is something which isn't in the history book, something which is never recorded. A man, for instance, called James Cannon, I often wonder whether he is a forebear of uh, another man of that name. Maybe, I don't know. i say for the moment, no relation. It is the happiness of America that there is no rank above that of free man existing in it. And much of our future welfare and tranquility will depend on its remaining so forever. For this reason, great and overgrown rich men will be improper to be trusted. They will be too apt to be framing distinctions in society because they will reap the benefits of all such distinctions. Honesty, common sense and a plain understanding, when unbiased by sinister motives, are fully equal to the task. Let no man represent you who would be disposed to form any rank above that of free man. That was the agitation that was going on in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, New York, all the big cities at that time among the working people, and elections that were taking place which were bringing people like Cannon into the representation. And that was an agitation which broke out in great economic riots, food riots of every description. In 1789 there was massive riots in, in Philadelphia demanding that there should be price controls successfully successfully demanding that there should be price controls. It was economic, it was agitation, it was economic. And Paine, when he was with the masses, when he was in Philadelphia, there with the masses, uh, subscribed to it. He had, for instance, earlier uh, talked about, flirted with the idea of some kind of property qualification for the vote. In this period, 1778, 1779, he dismissed that. No property qualification for the vote. Everybody has the vote. And he came in with all that agitation, uh, with cannon and the like, for those kind of demands. And in the army too. Perhaps more importantly than anything else, those things that took place in the army in between 1776 and 1783, those are the things that are not recorded in history books, nowhere recorded in them at all. There was in the army the most astonishing agitation continuing. It was not a situation, as you're told in the history books, that the American army was all united, that they were all united behind Washington and Wayne and the rest of their officers, that Butler was a man that all of them looked up to and so on. That wasn't what was going on in the army at all. There was a tremendous skepticism and a tremendous movement of agitation against the officers that went on in the army at that time. And Payne's writings had done a lot to promote it. How do I know that? I, I, I know it for one reason only. I'll tell you how I know it. I read, a, uh, I read a novel by a man called Howard Fast. I think I've read quite a lot of history books on this period, and you don't find this operation that was going on in the army at all. But there is a man called Howard Fast. He was uh, a member of the Communist Party for a period, and he wrote a whole number of novels about American history, historical novels. If you ever see a book by Howard Fast, it's probably worth getting if it was written before 1952. If it was written after 1952, it will not be worth getting. There will be a lot of Zionist drivel. But uh, before 1952, it was uh, the, the novels that he wrote were electric, really electric novels. But the novel which really shook me right to the core, which I, you can't come across, of course, you won't find it anywhere, it's, uh, probably for reasons of that. But uh, uh, it's, a, it's a book called The, the Proud and the Free. And it's a, it's a novel uh, which takes as its subject the rising in the Pennsylvania line. Now, the army, the American army, was composed of militia, the lines that were recruited, sometimes conscripted, but mostly recruited of volunteers, most of them volunteers, from the working people of the big cities uh, and the big states of America. And, and the, uh, the Pennsylvania line was the most famous of them. And General Wayne, after Washington, was probably one of the most famous generals of the American War of Independence. What happened was this that the, uh, for, for years and years and years, the, uh, the, the, the army in the Pennsylvania line, the Pennsylvania line, had marched under Wayne, and the officers, this is the truth of it, the officers were really all the time playing a double game, all the time hedging their bets against the likelihood of American-British victory. The officers were not dedicated to the American cause or any of that drivel. 
They were people that were put there in order to keep the people in charge. They were interested in the prospect of an American victory. Not only they would have preferred the prospect of an American victory, but just in case there wasn't an American victory, they were going to make bloody certain that they were the people, were the people who'd been defeated. That they, therefore, night after night, the officers from starving, utterly depleted army, utterly wrecked, People starved, the most vicious punishments made for any kind of disobedience and so, so on and so forth. The officers would take the night off and they would dine over and over again, dine each night with the great Tory British supporting gentry in the localities where the army took place. One night they went out on the eve of uh, January the 1st, New Year's Eve, uh, 1781. They went out, the whole 17 of them, all the officers from the line, went out to dine with the British gentry. And, uh, uh, and what happened that night, because a number of people had been killed from starvation or died from starvation that night, was that a mutiny was plotted. I mean, you can call it a mutiny if you like, but what happened was that in each barrack they elected a committee of sergeants and the committee of sergeants under a man called Billy Bowser and composed and literally composed uh, probably purposely, although it was elected right across the line, composed of an Irishman, a Jew, a black slave, the, a Scotsman. Uh, uh, Billy Bowser himself, his uh, nationality, where he came from, isn't clear. But these are the people that, that formed the committee uh, that, 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 uh, that elected themselves as the people that were in charge of the Pennsylvania line uh, instead of the officers. I just want to, just because I believe that this does tell you where any, what was going on at that time, and it is important to understand these things because these sorts of things are going on all the time now in all different parts of the world, to tell you a little bit of, just to read you a little bit of this, because I think it, uh, it does bring it home to you. As the whole, uh, the whole line drew up on parade in the evening, ready to march out, and just as they drew out on parade to march out, they heard the, the, the hooves of the officers' horses coming back from uh, uh, what was effectively a night, and because it was New Year's Day, a day's revelry with the, British, uh, uh, with, the, with the British gentry in the area. So here are our officers, said Danny Connell. We stood side by side waiting in the line dressed like grenadiers. The music finished and there was no other sound than the drumming of hooves as the officers rode down upon us and drew up their horses a few yards away. I counted them. There were 17 of them, many of them reg regimental officers, with Anthony Wayne, Brigadier General of the Line, uh, among them, and boys for them. He, with Colonel Butler, stepped his horse forward and demanded, I break off here to remind you, that Wayne and Butler, you, you, those are the officers whose uniforms you can see in Bath. Uh, those are the people who, who are uh, uh, proclaimed as the, as the top people of the American Revolution, the people that sustained it, the brave heroes of the American Revolution. What in hell's name is the meaning of all this? Who gave these men the order to parade? The committee, answered Billy Bowser quietly. The committee? What committee? The committee of sergeants, answered Billy Bowser, still in the same term. The committee of sergeants, said Wayne, the committee of sergeants, and he raised his voice, hurling it into the cold and rising wind. This band, I tell you. But it was too late, and we stood on our ranks, and we watched silent, except for the wail of a little child that lifted over and above the men and mingled with, with, with the winter winds. Either disband or prepare to take the consequences. Butler said, I know you Billy Bowser and I know you Jack Maloney and I know that dirty Jew Levy and that black nigger Holt and you too Jamie Stewart and well indeed do I know that slicer Connell who was swept up with a dung from the streets of Dublin and I have a long memory. We are not hiding our faces, answered Billy Bowser. And after a little bit of this dialogue, in which this goes on for a little bit of time, shouting abuse and so on, they realized that, uh, that uh, they, they meant business. And so uh, this, is, this, is, this is how, it, how this little passage ends off. What are your demands, insisted Wayne stolidly, but biting his underlip until the blood smeared through, his fists clenched, his cheek twitching. I have given you my word as an officer and a gentleman. What are your demands? We have no demands of you, General Wayne. There is nothing you can do for us. Our demands are to the people and the Congress. If I can write them, and can you write them, my general? Asked Billy Bowser, grinning bitterly at the handsome young man before him, taking a fold of his cloak between his fingers. Will you cover all our rags with this? Will you feed us with a slop from your New Year's dinner? Will you pay us who have not been paid these six months past? 
Will you bring back your children who died of disease and hunger? Will you put shoes under our bleeding feet? His voice raised. He still held the fold of Wayne's cloak. And Wayne stood rigid as steel while Bowser spoke. Or will you scrape together our bloody tracks over 5,000 miles of road for five years? Will you give us back our honor? We who have been beaten and lashed as foreign scum. Will you honor us with even one of your own to lead us? Will you stop the ache of, of hunger in our bellies so that while you fatten yourselves in the houses of the goddamn patroons and the cursed British gentlemen, we must watch, watch our little drummer lads die for want of a shred of meat? Will you march us against the British enemy instead of leaving us to rot in these cursed encampments because you have not the guts to risk a fight that might bring a frown from that rotten betraying Congress? Will you bring all the lines together so that they will stop plotting against each other and go against the enemy? Will you make the Declaration of Independence the law of this army? Will you give us equal bounty and equal pay? Will you hang every officer who kills one of us in his anger, who cheats us, who sells our food, who gambles away our pay, who speculates in the Philadelphia market with our clothing, who insults our women, who kicks our children? Will you do that, General Wayne? Will you declare that the Jersey and Pennsylvania farmers who hold their land in tenancy from the patroons and the lords now have it in freehold forever? Will you tell them that if they give us food we will fight to the death for their freehold? Will you guarantee a hundred acres of land for every man in this army? You can do that, General Wayne, for there is land without end or limit in Pennsylvania, and no one owns it but the lords in London. Will you take it from them and give it to us now? Will you give us a stake in this? Will you now? Come now! The line is standing to arms in the bitter cold, and you would not have them stand in the cold the whole night through. You would not have that, for then they would think that this is another evidence of the ways of the gentry and the disregard they have for what a simple man feels. So speak out, General Wayne! In a fury, Bowser finished and he flung away the general's cloak as if it were dirt. But Wayne didn't move and there came a sigh out of the paraded men. And then Wayne said softly, These are not demands I can satisfy, as well you know. Then you can satisfy one other demand of ours, said Billy Bowser. Get on your horse and ride out of our sight and take your damn staff with you. The lot of you are like an abomination. That was uh, what happened there. And the line moved out of uh, Morristown where the rising had taken place and moved through New Jersey and as it moved through New Jersey the whole people of New Jersey rose to meet the line they were fed they were barracked they went into Princeton where they were fed and barracked by all the local farmers and working people from that locality the, the line sustained itself where it was but it didn't sustain itself or catch the link there was no way in which it caught the link into the other lines. The idea of the mutiny was as it were before its time. It was too early. And because it was too early, it didn't catch the other lines and the other lines didn't rise. And therefore they were forced that Pennsylvania line after some several days in which the army for the first time was well fed, properly run, properly trained, properly with uh, weapons, properly cleaned, really fit to meet the enemy, were forced to go back and treat again with their officers or go over to the British. Not prepared to go over to the British, they had to go and treat again with their officers and the officers came in under different terms, no victimization, and they came back with the same... Uh, no, no one was hanged or shot as they would have been if there had been no mutiny, uh, if, the, if the mutiny had collapsed on that first night that Wayne came back. They went back, it didn't catch, and eventually Wayne, this is another thing, nowhere in the history books you'll find it, Wayne took that line into the heart of the British Army, almost purposefully took them into the very heart of the British Army, in enormous, huge, huge uh, forces against them. Right, only about two or three months before the eventual American victory at Yorktown, he took that line right into the middle and watched them being carved to pieces. Deliberately, I believe, quite clearly and deliberately, took them into that line, watched the whole lot of them being carved to pieces, rather than have that spirit that was sustained in that mutiny outlive the, Amer outlive the American victory at Yorktown with all the effect that would have had in a, an army that was about to be disbanded. Now that was, what, that was what went on in the American Revolution. Two battles going on at the same time, not what you read in the history books. And in general, when he was with the masses, Payne was out of, out of America at the time of that rising in the line. I believe if he'd been in America, we would have something on record from him. 
in one of his crisis papers or something of that kind which would have supported it. But when he was with the masses, when he was part of them, then his writing carried through that aspiration of a new republic and a free republic in which the working people would be in charge. Now, the Americans won at Yorktown and the British were driven out. But this second battle wasn't won. It wasn't won. It wasn't won because it wasn't sustained. Just as the Pennsylvania line didn't link with the other lines, so the agitations that took place in Philadelphia and the like didn't catch with the other cities, so that there was no possibility of sustaining it, not even sustaining it in the way that they sustained it later in France, even for a few years or even for a few months. They didn't really sustain it for any period at all. And it's true that the Washingtons, although Washington is himself a rather bizarre figure, uh, more like the Adamses and the like, took over the, the machinery of the state, the merchants took over the machinery of the state, and Paine didn't understand what was happening to him. Here was a man who had, in many ways, created the aspirations, which was able to give, give rise to that great resistance which had been the American Revolution, but didn't understand what was happening afterwards, how he was chucked out. Oh, Paine, very interesting to see you. Ah, oh, nice to see you. How are you getting on? Good evening. Uh, there's a nice little house we bought up for you, about 500 miles from any industrial centre. If you go up there, uh, you uh, in I understand you're interested in building bridges. Well, uh, why not build a bridge? Uh, uh, we need a few bridges in the new America. Uh, good evening. He'd say, but uh, can I not be of some assistance? Uh, can I not uh, perhaps be the clerk to the Congress? Come perhaps stand and... No, no, uh, thank you very much. You really did sterling work for us at the time. But would you mind going away now instead of bothering us? And he was cut off and chucked out and... Let, was turned away in order to build it. For, for five or six years, he did practically nothing. And then he came back again to Britain. He set up in Rotherham, uh, where I think his works, you can still go and see his works, anyone from that part of the country, set up in Rotherham in order to build bridges. That was his interesting thing. I want to build bridges now. I've had my revolution, and I'm very interested in building bridges. And of course, as someone who was, um, uh, had been, played this part in the American Revolution, had written, friend of Washington's, been side by side with Washington, at some one time had been a secretary of the foreign affairs, and so on and so forth. He was tremendously welcomed by the liberals. They loved him. He, he went down and spent a, 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 a whole, a, a whole a week with Burke, Edmund Burke, you know, the man who had written the magnificent uh, uh, dissertation uh, available to about eight people uh, at uh, eight guineas. Uh, magnificent dissertation on the case to the American colonies. Uh, Edmund Burke had a wonderful place down there. Duke of Portland had an even more wonderful place. In fact, he had about 15 wonderful places. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and Paine was a tremendously welcome guest. He'd go there and they'd all say, have you met, have you met Tom? He'd, Tom Paine, frightfully exciting. You know who's coming to dinner tonight? Tom Paine's coming to dinner. You know, radical, bit of a red, haha, <laughs> but, uh, you know, very nice man now. Uh, uh, builds bridges, you know, very interested in bridges. And, uh, uh, he's coming. He's coming to dinner, uh, and uh, so Paine was welcomed into this uh, liberal ambiance, and he was. Uh, and then something happened. I mean, what happened actually was the French Revolution, or rather, <laughs> minor matter, uh, which disturbed the peace of this uh, uh, of this very friendly relationship which he had with the liberals. French Revolution was rather different to the American Revolution as far as the British bourgeoisie were concerned. Uh, it was a, a slightly more um, embarrassing matter. For, for start with, it was closer. Uh, secondly, uh, it threatened uh, in a rather uh, uneasy way. Not at first, perhaps. At first, uh, when Burke, the same Burke that had supported the uh, uh, American colonies, uh, got up in the House of Commons initially to uh, oppose the uh, uh, French Revolution, he was shouted down by Charles James Fox, the Duke of Portland, who'd come in from the House of Lords. You know, you can move around. You know, you can move from one place to the other. Duke of Portland, down with you, Burke, you old reactionary. Ha, 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 ha. See you at dinner. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, these, these things are the... How dare you speak up against the, uh, the, how dare you speak out against the French Revolution? The French Revolution is a new time, it's a great new reason, and we're all going to have a wonderful time on the, uh, we, we know some of these French revolutionaries, we know Brissot very well, and Condorcet is a very intelligent man, Camille Desmoulins, a bit of a loony when he gets in the streets, but he's <laughs> all right otherwise. Uh, uh, you know, we, we will get on quite all right with these people, and everything's fine, so uh, 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 the situation immediately wasn't uh, quite so bad. But very soon, uh, the, uh, the uh, rising propertied interests, if you like, in Britain 
began to realize that there was a very serious threat here. Then you began to get a very savage counterattack against the French Revolution. And of course, this same windbag Burke, uh, you know, there he was wheeled out. As a matter of fact, he was getting a bit poor. He'd come over from Ireland and he hadn't got much money. So they said, we'll give you a pension of 1,500 a year, but let's really start a campaign against the French Revolution. And so Burke wrote his reflections on the French Revolution price, 19 guineas, uh, speeches in the House of Commons. Absolutely fantastic stuff about how in 1688... God and the king had met in unison and established a constitution and God and king and the constitution were there forever to be, they were, it, they were in the minds of people forever. It acts, although it is dribble, it is very much the same kind of conservative Tory ideology which goes on today. You know, this idea of the ongoing unity of religion, uh, religion, God, uh, kings, uh, all these things are something which are central to our social fabric. But at any rate, liberals scattered, just went. And the whole, the whole, the pit, the pit administration started with this sort of liberal atmosphere, you know, friendly and so on and so forth. And pit, but then, of course, what happened was that the whole administration came behind the, the ideas in Burke's reflections and started to move the machinery of the state, which then was fairly powerful, started to move it into the areas of the cities in order to ensure that uh, any kind of uh, French Revolution didn't happen in Britain. Now that was the situation, liberals scattered and the Tories on the rampage with Burke, the old liberal, uh, now a declared Tory, absolutely 100% behind them. And here it was that Paine's life changes again. Comfortable, liberal surroundings, bridge building, dinner parties, probably even bridge playing if they did play them then, all those things together uh, suddenly vanish. Now he suddenly sees what's happening, goes to France a couple of times and sees what's happening. And just as in America he had been lit up by all the developments and agitation there, so again he was lit up by what happened in France. And he came back from France, scrubbed the operation in Rotherham, took a little room in a pub in Islington, at the Angel Islington, went upstairs, uh, ordered about 15 bottles of whiskey, sat down uh, and wrote for day after day after day, and he wrote then this book, The Rights of Man, and he wrote it in direct answer to, uh, to Burke. It's one of the, uh, it is one of the greatest books in, uh, in our history, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to read out a great deal of it, because uh, every one of you should have read The Rights of Man. There shouldn't be anyone here who hasn't read The Rights of Man. It, what he's saying, really, is this. Here's Burke with all his sympathy for these damned Marie Antoinettes and all these uh, 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 profitable puppets in France, and his sympathy, it's a sympathy of, with Burke with these people that really aggravates him, and he says, not one glance of compassion, not one commiserating reflection that I can find throughout his book has he bestowed on those who lingered out the most wretched of lives, a life, life without hope in the most miserable of prisons. It's painful to behold a man employing his talents to corrupt himself. Nature has been kinder to Mr. Burke than he is to her. He is not affected by the reality of distress touching his heart, but by the showy resemblance of it striking his imagination. He pities the plumage, but forgets the dying bird. In other words, pain sympathizes immediately with the mass of the people there. He sympathizes with their movement. He sympathizes with the overthrow of monarchy. He says, France has not leveled, it has exalted. It has put down the dwarf to raise up the man. That was his idea. The dwarfs, the aristocrats, the monarchs, they're all finished. And now the man, the woman, they will come into, into their own. And Burke and all his people talking about chaining people into slavery year after year after year, constitutions, kings and gods all getting together and combining in some massive conspiracy which extends beyond people's existence, beyond people's lives and the like. All that to hell with it down with it. And he defends the French Revolution. He defends the storming of the Bastille. And he shows how the masses move. And when the masses move, they move much more compassionately than when these aristocrats and monarchs move. And he shows all those things. It comes out quite clear and direct. And the attack on monarchs and the attack on titles, all these things are in this book. And this book really had more effect, really, this is the truth of it, on the mass of the British working people than any other book before or since.
For instance, there are any comrades from Sheffield here? Sheffield was foremost among the more democratic towns of the kingdom towards the end of the century in acclaiming by ox roasting, cannon firing and immense processions the triumph of our French brethren over despots and despotism. In 1794, the Society for Constitutional Information, composed of those, very good British name that by the way, isn't it? They never call themselves Revolutionary Party or anything, they call themselves the Society for Constitutional Information. Composed of those who saw in the French Revolution a summons to Englishmen to rise on behalf of liberty, grew bolder and held a great meeting on Castle Hill where the crowd sang to the tune of the national anthem a song beginning, God save great Thomas Paine. I mean, you can imagine, you can just imagine the kind of effect that has on people sitting in Parliament and in clubs in London. That expensive copy went like wildfire. 150,000, 200,000 copies in a matter of weeks. Literally like that. Woof, again. The whole of the, uh, the, whole of the uh, royalties going back to societies for constitutional information, all different kinds of little associations which have sprung up, they got the royalties from those books. Not a penny of it went back to Tom Paine. And then, of course, the government moved. And then they set in chain the most fantastic repression, not only against Paine, but against the whole reading of the rights of man. Anyone found reading the rights of man, anyone found reading it, anyone found who had heard anyone reading it, that is, if you heard anyone reading it, was due for 10 years imprisonment, sometimes 20 years imprisonment. If you sold the rights of man, it was a capital offence. That was the situation after about uh, uh, 1794. In fact, for two years, 1794 and 1795, they, uh, they by government decree, they shifted the... Uh, uh, remember, remember the 5th of November, the burning of Guy, you know, poor old Guy Fawkes, you know, the burning of, of him. They shifted that by decree. They said, this year we won't burn Guy Fawkes, we'll burn Tom Paine. So it was, you know, remember, remember, filthy old Tom Paine, burn him down in the ground. Paine, Paine, curse be his name. All children were taught to recite all kinds of uh, uh, doggerel in order to attack Paine. That was the repression that came. But the repression never stamped it out. Never stamped it out at all, all over the country there in a pub in Todmorden, they had a, a locked uh, attic. They had an attic locked in steel with a steel door. And in it, they kept, wait for it, books. They kept books there, and there was one book. That, all the books were numbered, so that every time the police came up, they had their little register there, and they were all numbers. Number one, well, that's probably... Um, uh, uh, Twelfth Night, uh, number two, that's probably uh, the Bible, and so on and so forth. They said, well, what it, I'm afraid we don't know what it is, they're all numbered. But there was none number, one number, one number that was taken out every bloody time. It was always out. Was always, and they had to go to the Halifax Library, the repairs department of the Halifax Library, where they went down to the repairs department. Do you have any books being repaired here? Well, there's one that comes in that has to be repaired about every, one, every week, because it's read by about 50 people a week. What's that? The rights of man. That's how they launched the prosecution against the wretched little pub in Todmorden. They went to that extent to find out how they were selling Tom Paine's books. It had the most fantastic effect among the common people. And it was for the printing of Tom Paine's Rights of Man that Richard Carlyle, uh, Peter Eaton, all number of uh, uh, publishers, very bold, br brave men, uh, right up to Hetherington in the 1830s, who went to prison because they were publishing Tom Paine. Paine himself was prosecuted. He was uh, arraigned for trial, and he went, uh, he went to France uh, uh, just on the day before. He, he, un, un, without any question at all, if he'd stood for the prosecution, he would have been hanged. But he went to France. Now, why did he go to France? And here now we're coming into the third period of his life. Why did he go to France? He went to France for a simple reason that he had been elected a member of the assembly, the revolutionary assembly, by two districts, but particularly by Calais. And when the, he just got away from the prosecutors that were chasing him all the way down to Dover, got on the boat, came into Calais, amazing difference being chased from the prosecutors on one hand with the whole of the gentry and all the lumpen really chasing, them, chasing him out of Britain. And he comes into Calais and the whole town has a holiday. Everyone is out in Calais. Flags, here's Tom Paine coming. The packet comes in and there's cheered all the way through the streets. The mayor gives a speech. I mean, these sort of, you have to, when you say the mayor, you have to imagine a revolutionary mayor, if that's possible for you to imagine it. Uh, right, he gives a speech in favor of Tom Paine and Paine then is taken to Paris where he is, uh, uh, where he is um, uh, uh, brought into the convention. Now this, 
period of Payne's life, for now really he is getting to be quite an old man, with uh, apologies to certain people around. Uh, is, he is now uh, r rising 60 at this period. And the position now is that uh, uh, he comes into the, to the, the third period of his life. And what is happening in France now, of course, although it has similarities with what was happening in, uh, in America, has a, a very, very central strategic difference. And a strategic difference which Paine did not understand and it was never part of his philosophy and important for us to understand that it was never part of his philosophy because it's the great gap, if you like, the great flaw in the whole of his writings. He never understood this central strategic uh, uh, problem and that was that, of course, what was going on in France was a struggle about property, that there had been a revolution all right but now there really was an intense battle going on between those people who represented the working people, particularly of Paris, the Jacobins, the, the, the mountain, as they were called in the assembly because they sat on the high seats, the people that said, we have to press this on. It's no good having a revolution if you can't get any bread. We need the bread. We need the prices low. We've got to rock this, uh, the people that have property, the people that control particularly the food. We have to rock them. We have to keep them back on their heels. We have to have the people in charge of these things. And the Gironde, the Gironde, the plain, the people who sat on the floor of the Congress called the plain, the rich aristocratic people, the intelligent people, the Lafayettes, the people that had come to support the American Revolution, Condorcet, Brissot, Camille Desmoulins, all those people who, with whom Paine naturally associated because of the American struggle. He had known them in the American struggle. He spoke no French. He was, these people of course all spoke beautiful English, not to say beautiful American, and they, 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 they immediately took Paine under their wing. Immediately as it were, in the same way that Burke and Port the Duke of Portland had done, took Paine under their wing, and differently to what had happened in, uh, I in Britain, and as a matter of fact to what had happened in America, because he never felt the masses, because he wasn't as he was in America among the masses in Philadelphia, or as he was in Britain among the masses when he was working in Rotherham, in those pubs in London, all the places that he used to move among working people, in France there was no such contact could have no such contact, partly because of language, partly because of misunderstanding what was going on in the assembly, the kind of debates that were going on in the assembly, and partly because the people who were on the right, the, day, the bitter reaction, let's not be any doubt about it, bitter reaction that existed in the French Revolution at that time, uh, took him and uh, br brought him up as one of their own. The argument in which he, uh, he played a part, he did play a major part, was over the question of the execution of the king. And Paine, of course, because he argued all these things out as though it was all to do with pure reason, as though all you did was argue not in terms of the real class forces that were moving in the society, but just out of pure reason, took the argument that you should not kill the king because any capital punishment was wrong. He quoted Robespierre himself. He quoted a great speech from Robespierre in which Robespierre made the speech chucking capital punishment out of the French constitution. And he had said, therefore, well, what we need now, uh, we, we can't execute the king, we mustn't execute the king because of this principle about capital punishment. That's what he said. And uh, that's, that's, uh, that was the way in which the, the argument developed over the question of the execution of the king. Should the king be executed? Now, of course, what the Mara saw, what the Jacobin saw, what Robespierre saw, and see it so clearly as Marat saw it, but he saw it at any rate, was that what the king was doing there with his escapes and all, particularly the queen, by the way, that miserable intrigues that they were weaving in Europe, was standing up as the, as the centerpiece for reaction. They were the focus for the reaction. As long as they were there, they would be the focus for the whole of European reaction and the revolution itself was in peril. Not the revolution of the Brissots and the Condorcets, but the revolution of the sans culotte the revolution of the people of Paris, the people who wanted not only freedom, but they also wanted bread, and who saw that bread and freedom, as a matter of fact, were linked indissolubly. They saw that the king was central to that, and the king had better go, because if the king didn't go, they would continue to be that focus for all that kind of reaction. Paine didn't even see it in those terms, didn't even understand it in those terms, and therefore spoke in the assembly against the execution of the king. 
and was denounced by Marat for doing so. And therefore he sided with the reaction and because he sided with the reaction as the Jacobins got more and more control of the assembly and of the government machinery so pain slipped out of, uh, out of uh, fashion, uh, out of the, the public eye and indeed because he might eventually, probably wrongly of course, but eventually he was thrown into the Luxembourg prison as being sent a piece of the Gironde and of the, reaction, of the reactionary faction, of the faction. He spent 10 months in 1794 in prison and was let out when the reaction had won again, had beaten back the Jacobins, had beaten back the, the, the mob had been contained, the reaction won again and Payne came out to be patronised by Bonaparte and patronised by a whole lot of liberals again when he'd come out of prison. But here, perhaps, in many ways, is the most astonishing thing in the whole story. Because here, even now, even at the very end of his, uh, uh, end of his active life, in a period in which he knew, I think instinctively knew, that he was siding with the reaction, that he couldn't feel the touch of the people that he'd felt all before, here he still comes out, he still gets down, just before he went into prison, in prison, and when he came out of prison again, during that period in 1794, and addresses himself to writing another fantastic book. And it is a book which, once again, goes to the roots of the problems. It was a book about religion. He saw the importance of religion. Now, Paine was a religious man. He was a deist. Uh, he, he believed there was one supernatural power uh, which, di which uh, operated everything. It didn't matter very much that he, he thought that. But anyway, he thought that. And he was worried about atheism, so he wrote what he thought was going to be a thing, getting people away from atheism towards uh, some kind of reasonable attitude to this thing. But what he was forced to do when he applied his mind to this question of deism and religion, what he was forced to do in the situation was to come to terms with revealed religion, that is, with the Christian religion, and how it revealed itself uh, uh, day by day. And of course, because he still had that touch, he still had the the wonderful journalistic power to see through humbug, to see through uh, uh, superstition, above all superstition, what he ended up by writing, The Age of Reason, is the most savage attack upon, effectively, upon a religion that has ever been written. He set out to defend religion, and he wrote what effectively was the greatest attack ever written upon it. And what he didn't re realize that he was doing was that all those former liberal friends of his, all the... All the ruling classes of Europe and America depended not on the religion. It's not on religion that they depend on to shore up their miserable monarchic institutions or property institutions or whatever it may be. What they depend on is the superstition. See, what he, what he does is, he, he, I, I've never read anywhere else, he shows how the scriptures came to be written 350 years after the events. You know, I don't know if any of you tried writing anything 350 years after the events. <laughs> You know, as uh, people that saw it, you know, uh, I, saw, I saw this 350 years, oh, will, will you tell the jury? I mean, even the jury. <laughs> it, it went right to the root of it, that's the point. It really tore up all the superstitions that underlay the property interests of America, the people that have been friendly with pain in America, France and Britain. And it is the reason why pain then was uh, forsaken by Bonaparte and the French liberals, went over to America, was a violent attack launched on him in America. This is a very old man, was he was an old man when he died, 72, but he spent the last four or five years of his life in total penury, hated and abused people. Children would be sent up to spit on the door, to shout out abuse against Tom Paine, and he died there with only three or four friends, utterly deserted, by all those liberals that in America and France and Britain had sustained him when it was in their interest to do so. And the reason for it, and the reason for that attack, as I read out at the beginning by that hack Edwards, the reason for it is that attack on organized and received and revealed religion. That was the thing, finally, even more than the rights of man and the like, that was the thing, finally, which uh, wrote pain out of the history books uh, and wrote pain out of the history books for a hundred years because the Earl of Shaftesbury paid a man 500 pounds, a man called Oldies, to write an attack on Paine, and for a hundred years the real story of Thomas Paine was suppressed in the public prints and in published books and the like. Now that's the story, uh, uh, comrades, and perhaps uh, I'll just uh, finish up a couple of things, uh, a couple of things just to end up with. 
and that is this, that uh, there is, if you like, a Marxist line on pain. I can give you a line which will win you 10 out of 10 uh, at any weekend school. I'm not too, too trivial about it because it's all absolutely correct, but the line is this, that pain wavered in the American Revolution about which side he was on in the central battle between the pro propertyless interests and the propertied interests. Even in Britain, when he wrote The Rights of Man, he was uncertain about the importance of association, the importance of people coming together in order to force through the kind of policies that he was outlining, and that in France, openly, he allied with the reaction. And that central to all of those, uh, all of those parts of his life is the uh, uh, uncertainty about what the extent and importance of property is in the relationship between human beings that he was defended private property sometimes, attacked it in others. He wrote a pamphlet called Agrarian Justice, which seems to argue certain forms of socialistic uh, uh, public ownership. He, but he wrote a whole lot of other things which defended the right of private, of private property in various, uh, in, 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 in various formations. But to end the matter there, and just to say, well, that's it, you've won, you've done it, congratulations, you've, you've, you've got the line right, and understand about property and, you know, he's with the reactionaries in France and so on, I think is really to miss it. What Paine wrote and did is important. Important, really, for some very, very simple reasons, that he addressed himself to the masses. He spoke to the masses. He believed in the masses. He didn't believe in the masses as a concept in the same way as, say, the levelers did or, or the diggers in the, in, the, in, the, in the 17th century, but as part of them, as a fighting force, as something which all can be moved. And he believed in this idea of people being in charge of their destiny. He was centrally believed in that, and he believed in the idea of the masses moving in order to take control of their destiny. And that is very, very important, very important for us. We talk about the rank and file. That's the thing that distinguishes us, isn't it? Of all the things which distinguish us from other socialists and revolutionaries, it is this central belief in the rank and file, this central belief that all politics has to relate to the rank and file. There is this passage, never quoted in the history books from uh, the rights of man, which shows why pain was so concerned with the masses and so uh, intent upon stretching the thing uh, to the masses. It appears to general observation that revolutions create genius and talents, but these events do no more than bring them forward. There is existing in man a mass of sense lying in a dormant state and which, unless something excites to action, will descend with him in that condition to the grave. As it is to the advantage of society that the whole of the faculty should be employed, the construction of government ought to be such as to bring forward by quiet and regular operation all that extent of capacity which never fails to appear in revolutions. And that's really the answer to the question, why the rank and file? It's the mass of sense lying dormant, the extent of capacity which isn't touched, which needs to be excited to action. That is the explanation. That's why we're in it. And this is the terribly important thing that we know, of course we know, uh, the method that Paine adopted which was a method simply of uh, applying reason to a situation and, and, and assuming that reason would provoke the, of itself, provoke the governments that was necessary and overthrow tyrants and the like. We know now that those are corporations there, huge, great propertied interests, unelected, undemocratic, great, big, irresponsible power groups which are there, and in order to defeat them, those people that want to defeat them have to associate with one another, they have to b b come together and pool their resources. All those things we know. And those things aren't in pain, of course, at all. But what is in pain, and what we can get from him, is this idea that although we need that party, that association, whatever you want to call it, although we desperately need that, it is absolutely useless unless it is contacted and rooted in the rank and file. The point is that whether people rise or not depends on whether that party is built inside the rank and file, in the masses, and depends on whether or not we can apply the same kind of reason 
The argument, the reason, we believe with pain on that, that the reason, the masses are capable of reason. There's no other antidote, if you like, to racialism and the like. And it's precisely in order to coordinate that reason, to coordinate the argument, and get it a wider influence that you need the party, not to withdraw from it or to come inside the party, outside of the reason and outside of the masses. The representative democracy. Of course we know that the representative democracy that Payne outlined has been, uh, uh, has been savaged by corporations, emasculated by great big corporations and the like. Of course we know those things, but equally we should know that it is a representative democracy that we're after. We are after that. We're after a democracy that comes from the bottom up. We know it has to be based on the workshop floor. We know that. Workers, councils and the like. But the arguments for the representative democracy, as against heredity and superstition, are there in Tom Paine. Those arguments are relevant. He believed above all in the masses. That was central to him. He believed in their ability to change, in their ability to change things. He wrote in a language which they understood. His intense belief that the masses could understand things and could, through their understanding, shape their own destiny. I believe the truth of the matter is this, comrades, that there's more in the great clear rhetoric for the working people which is written by Tom Paine there's perhaps more for us in that than there is in a hundred transitional programs and all the puffed up, proud, hypocritical ways in which so-called advanced Marxists talk to one another. Oh, ye that love mankind, ye that dare oppose not only the tyranny but the tyrant, stand forth. Every spot of the old world is overrun with oppression. Freedom hath been hunted round the globe. Asia and Africa hath long expelled her. Europe regards her like a stranger, and England hath given her warning to depart. Oh, receive the fugitive, and prepare in time an asylum for mankind.